There has never been a better time to play Cyberpunk 2077 than right now. If you played the dystopian sci-fi experiment in emotional terrorism back when it first released in 2020 and, like me, have trudged your way back to the doorstep of Night City, you'll know exactly what I mean. And since the team refuses to talk to me about this anymore since I hijacked the last couple of meetings, here's five things I love and one thing I hate about Cyberpunk 2077. Number one, the 2.0 update. The most recent major base game update, 2.0, kicked in the door, stripped off the wallpaper and ripped out the floorboards. A home reno if ever there was one. While I normally cannot stand change, the various UI improvements, changes to cyberware application and upgrades, as well as tweaks to stamina, enemy AI sensitivity, and a whole host of vehicle-related tomfoolery make playing Cyberpunk much more enjoyable. For those just coming in, oh, how I envy you. Congrats, you can navigate the phone and quest log without your hands cramping up flicking in and out of menus. Good for you. You won't accidentally skip dialogue because you crouched. Yeah, yeah, all right, show off. You can run without needing a break every 20 seconds. We get it. For real though, discovering these changes organically over the last couple of days has been wonderful. And while I still haven't quite wrapped my head around vehicle combat just yet, the driving in a straight line part is already doing enough damage to public property, thank you very much, I am still keen to turn Night City into my own fury road. And speaking of... Number two, Night City Living. The fractured home of progress and poverty, Night City, feels as alive as the characters that fill it. It's a character in and of itself. Without even looking at the map, you can tell exactly where you are just by the environmental details around you. The glittering streets of city centre are only dimmed by the looming skyscrapers of our corpo overlords. The people of Watson cram themselves into mega blocks, a cycle of work, sleep, repeat, all to chase a dream that's forever just out of their reach. The Badlands feel dry even when it rains, and Pacifica, once a crowning jewel of lavish privilege, is left gutted, a war above and below its surface. As you level up and expand your arsenal, the threat of death dies down. V Swagger does the talking just as much as their weapons. But in those opening few hours, as I bumbled my way through quests, stumbled into gang fights and brawls way beyond my skill level, Night City was a jungle. One that promised to deliver an ass kicking if I didn't kick first. One where every other backstreet and shifty alcove held the potential for eddies or flesh wounds. And look, all right, I'll cop to it. I just think it's damn pretty. I'm not a city living girl myself, but dang, if I wasn't taking every opportunity to find the tallest building to stand on, looking out longingly across the glittering horizon, past the smog and soot to a brighter future. Ah, oh, the drama. As beautiful as the city is in the daytime, sunlight hitting those harsh metal edges at just the right angle to deliver lens flares right into my retinas. Once the sun goes down, that's when photo mode comes out. I'm not a cruisy, driving around for the sake of it type of player, but damn, if Cyberpunk didn't give me every excuse in the book to try and be one. If you just ignore all the people bouncing off the hood of the car, it's quite a peaceful watch. Number three, friends in low places. With people like me on the roads, living in a place like Night City is bound to mess with your head. So no surprise that V surrounds themselves with weirdos from all walks of life. Some voluntarily and others, well, by fate's divine hand. Silver hand, that is. <laughs> I will see myself out. Point is, as someone who thrives on a good narrative, I was foaming at the mouth for more quality time with our merry band of misfits and murderers. Let's start with our resident rocker boy turned brain parasite, Johnny Silverhand. He recently got a facelift courtesy of the 2.0 update that nearly sent me into cardiac arrest, but I think I did a good job at hiding it. Something of a devil on your shoulder at times, the relationship between Johnny and V is one that will shape your playthrough. It's not easy to be at odds with someone taking up living space in your brain. You want a car girl with family trauma? Well, Pen and Palmer and the family she found in the Aldercados is right there. It is frankly a criminal act that I cannot romance her as female V, but the friendship we forged during our playthrough is easily one of my favorites. Judy Alvarez fills the role of a guarded hacker and techie that will go to the ends of the earth for those she loves. 
then there's River Ward, the idealistic cop trying to work within a system that is rotten to its very core. Goro Takamura, another one that got away in the dating game, is a man of principle almost to a fault. He's also easily the funniest texter in the game. Give me a DLC that's just a back and forth with this man trying to decipher V's weird lingo. And finally, Kerry Urodyne. Caught in the shadow of a legend, he's stuck learning the same lesson over and over again. No matter how far you run, you can't outrun yourself. While Cyberpunk doesn't have the same depth of character interactions as, say, Baldur's Gate 3, your choices do affect how they respond to you. Not everyone is going to want to be pals with someone who gives them the cold shoulder or starts offing their exes. But even without that extra layer of engagement, I still found them to be really compelling characters, with lives and stories outside of V. In my opinion, who you're forced to interact with can make or break an experience as narrative heavy as one like Cyberpunk. They are how we feel our way around this world, their values and morals guiding or grating against our own. Look, my V might be as close to a cyber psycho as you can get, but she's not about to let down her friends. Number four, Cyberware. V's development isn't only limited to their emotional journey. There's a whole other story to be told in how you outfit them with Chrome. There's a decent amount of options available to you to deck out your V in as much or as little missile launching, ribbon slicing, flesh carving weaponry as your sick little heart desires. Provided, of course, you have the eddies to pay for it all. My personal bit of storytelling for V was that as I played, I would periodically go through and change her appearance, adding scars and a sickly hue to her eyes as she progressively became more and more decked out in cyberware. The very tech she used to save people and carve out her place in Night City was slowly turning on her, piece by piece. Now, while I don't feel that CD Projekt Red went far enough into exploring the physical and mental ramifications of turning oneself into a human fidget spinner, I do like the way cyberware is woven into combat and even basic traversal. A specked out Sandevastan will never not make me feel like a time wizard, and I will die by the statement that the Mantis Blades are the sickest weapon known to man. Now, I hear you. Oh, but Jem, the moral and ethical implications of stripping away flesh to make way for machinery. The effect that has on the human mind and soul. How the idea of corporations privatizing our very bodies is a threat we're already facing today. I know, it's great. It's all so tortured and there's so much room to wax philosophical. Which brings me to... Number five, a story of legends. To me, Cyberpunk 2077 is a game about the inevitability of death and the cycles we go through to accept it. Some go out kicking and screaming, some go out calm and content, but one day we must all go to the ground. All we can do is try to leave a pretty corpse or a lasting impression with the people that we love. I know, pretty cheery, right? I finished 2077 a good few times now, and every single time I walk away feeling defeated. I know, that doesn't sound like a ringing endorsement, but I ask you to consider how cool it is that a story can wrap itself so tightly around my dead little heart that it can make you feel so profoundly empty after giving you so much to enjoy. I love a good emotional kick to the guts, delivered swiftly and with as much wind up as possible, which Cyberpunk, I feel, pulls off spectacularly. There are so many little missions that are completely unrelated to V's struggle that hit so much harder because of that very reason. They're a reminder that even as our protagonist, V is still very much a small cog in a much larger machine. Night City moves, breathes, and bleeds with or without you. And finally, the one thing I hate about Cyberpunk 2077. The one thing in this little experiment in nihilism that I cannot reconcile no matter how hard I try. You cannot pet nibbles the cat whenever you like. What the f Are you kidding me? In the year of our Lord 2023, in a triple A multi-million dollar game with a story that constantly seeks to remind us that life is both short and we should take every chance we get at happiness and you don't let me pet the cat whenever I want? Life is cruel and devoid of meaning and that is fine, but at least let me get some ear scratches in there, you maniacs. <clears throat> anyway, those are my thoughts on the state of Cyberpunk 2077. There's no such thing as a perfect game, and it won't be everyone's cup of tea, but it is definitely mine. And I would highly recommend you give it a crack if you're still on the fence. 
If only so, I have someone else to complain about Mr. Nibblestorm.